Hi everybody, this is Wanda Alger and today is Thursday, April 15. And I wanna share with you today a revelation, a word of why I believe President Trump has been commissioned by the Lord to finish his second term consecutively. Why it is so important that he fulfills the commission on his life because we as the body of Christ have also been, a commission, been commissioned. We have been given a mission and President Trump has a part in our fulfilling our commission. And this is something that I, I want to bring alert to in terms of the leadership void that there is in how we've gotten to this point and how we need to uh, rectify some things that have happened, our foundations that have been shaken and are crumbling, and how we as the body of Christ, the church, rather the ecclesia, we need to change some things. We need to reestablish some foundations. So I'm going to talk about apostles and prophets and about foundations and about President Trump and how I see his part in this whole picture. Uh, you know, there's no question that we have a leadership void today. We're looking for where are the healthy leaders in this country? Where's the leadership? And those who are missing President Trump, I believe it's because we desperately are looking for someone to lead, someone with a clear vision and, and able to know where are we even going. Well, you know, ultimately as believers in Christ, uh, we know that Jesus ultimately is the one that has the answers and it's our king that we follow and that we serve a, a greater kingdom than what's here. And we as, as believers really should be modeling what the world is looking for. We should be modeling leadership, healthy leadership. This is a passion of mine. Someone once asked me, why do you talk about leaders all the time? <laughs> it's because I am a leader and you know, my husband, he pastors a church and we want to raise up leaders. And my own journey, my own testimony is all about uh, leadership and why, our why the church has, has gotten into some of the messes that we have is because we haven't had healthy leadership. And then it's reflected in the culture around us. It's reflected in our national government. And you know, too many times I believe the church in years past has mistakenly tried to keep so separate from the world, oh no, we don't wanna get contaminated by them, that we've just kind of given them over to the world and look where we're at. Exactly, I mean, you can think about it. What, what influences us today? Hollywood, media, and government. We are all impacted by those on a daily basis. And yet how much has the body of Christ, has the church been willing to take ownership in those areas of our culture? Now, obviously there are some that, that have been doing that faithfully, but I'm talking about you know, the broad body of Christ in terms of embracing this call that we have to demonstrate the kingdom realities in our culture. That's what God has been preparing us for. But we need leaders. We need people to lead the way. That's what so many people are hungry for. And you know, last week, uh, I've been led to just study the life of King David. And I once released a word about two years ago, and it was about President Trump. And the Lord likened him to King David in specifically using the phrase, I am a man of war. Now that's what the Lord calls himself as he wars against his, his enemies. But he also spoke that over David because King David was a man of war. And so the Lord uh, spoke this word, I released it, as it relates to President Trump. Because President Trump, he has been warring against spiritual enemies. Uh, there have been principalities and powers <laughs> that have been warring against us as the body of Christ and against this nation. And indeed, that's what I believe uh, President Trump has, has been doing. And there certainly is a leadership. But this likening to, to David, as I study his life, we know that David was anointed even as a child, but what happened? Even after he was anointed and even recognized as the king, he went into a time of exile, much like President Trump seems to be in right now. Well, what happened during that time? And if you look at David, it's interesting from my perspective, just looking at the overall uh, setting of the story, I believe God was testing David's heart. He had some opportunities during that time he could have taken out Saul, his opposition. And probably because he had all of his mighty men with him and all, a lot of people behind him, uh, he probably could have justified it, but he didn't. But I believe God's test was, David, are you gonna do this my way? Uh, 
And then, just as God was testing David, I believe he's also testing the nation of Israel because they were divided at that time. I mean, the people, did they really want, you know, did they like Saul? They wanted Saul as the king. Uh, you know, what, what was their vision for their future? So today I can see a lot of parallels that I believe President Trump is being tested by the Lord in some ways. I know many people are praying for him. I believe that God is doing a deeper work in his heart because I believe that when he comes back for this second term, I believe he's going to be a changed person. And I believe God even has some upgrades to give to him, which I'm going to speak to in a minute. But we too are being tested. Uh, we have to decide you know, what it is we want. And more importantly, we have to take ownership. Ownership in how we've gotten to the point we have. Because everything that's coming out, the things that are being exposed, we should be asking ourselves, how did this happen? And how can we make sure it doesn't happen again? This, this is what we have to be looking at. It's not just enough to you know, prove some, you know, the, the election was fraudulent. It's not just enough to get, oh, you know, our president back. No, this is a much, much bigger picture that we as believers, we have to take responsibility because we've had a part in this and turning a blind eye and, and not being willing to get engaged in different things. We've been so, so narrow focused and I'm, you know, this is a broad generalized statement, I realize, but you know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, where are we? And we have to take account for this. And so as we look at leadership and what are the kinds of leaders that we want? You know, if you take notice, President Trump is giving a lot of endorsements right now for uh, potential leaders. Why? It's because he knows we have to reestablish some things and get some healthy people in here. Well, here's some scripture verses that can give us some framework for what we should be looking for that, yes, we should even expect to see in the government. One is Mark 10, 42 to 45, and this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. It says, Jesus called them and said, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. We see that right now, don't we? But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, obviously, this is a, a kingdom principle as believers. It's called servant leadership. We don't come to be served, but we're supposed to serve others. What we're learning right now about our government is that we're not supposed to be serving our government. They're supposed to be serving us. And this is what we're being confronted with. How did we get here? We've got to make this thing right again. It starts with us as believers, because this really is the heart of Christ, is that we're called to serve not to exercise power and control, but to lead out of this heart of wanting to help, wanting to establish, wanting to build up. Another scripture that comes to mind is Romans 12, six and eight. And in this passage, it talks specifically about seven different gifts that the Father gives everybody. Uh, everyone that's created, we have a measure of some of these gifts. There's seven of them listed. Uh, that basically uh, describe how we're motivated, how we're wired, what God put in us from birth that uh, just gives us a passion. And it talks about uh, these different gifts that differ according to the grace. It talks about prophesying. It says if you prophesy, then prophesy according to your faith. If you have a gift of serving, then serve. If you teach, then teach. If you exhort, then exhort. If you give, then do so generously. And then if you lead, if you have a gift of leadership, it says to do it with zeal. And then lastly, it lists the gift of mercy to do it with cheerfulness. If you have a gift of leadership, you're supposed to have zeal. So I'm asking, where are the leaders right now that exhibit the zeal of the Lord? That there is a fire behind them, a compelling, by the fear of the Lord, to want what is good, true, and right. Those are the kind of leaders that are gifted by God. They don't lead out of because they've got enough money or because they've got all these endorsements or uh, whatever their bio says. No, it's because they have a zeal of the Lord that they lead that way. 
That's something we should be discerning by the Spirit. We need these kinds of leaders in every area, obviously first in the church. We've got to have the fire of God. Conviction. Do we have any conviction about what is true and good and right? Those are the kinds of leaders that we want. And then there's a very interesting passage in the Old Testament about uh, the kind of leaders that God is looking for. And this, I think, could uh, specifically apply to the government realm. Because in this passage, it's in Exodus 18, verses 21 to 22, God is actually instructing Moses of who to look for in terms of helping to govern the nation of Israel at that time. And so God told Moses, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, and who hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Now that's an interesting uh, job description. Look for men who fear God. Not fear men, but fear God. You can trust them. I think that's pretty good general basic qualification for a good leader, that they're trustworthy. What's their track record? What do their relationships around them say? And they hate a bribe. Isn't this amazing? Human nature never changes. Yet you can't be bought. These are key. These are critical leadership qualifications that we should be looking for especially in the days to come. Now this can apply to the church, uh, but obviously these are very important in terms of what God wants to do today because we've got to separate out those things that the world would look at, that our flesh would look at. Because the whole purpose is we've got to build a foundation and this gets into what I believe God wants to do even through a second term for this president because our, our foundations are being shaken. Even in the church, I mean, there's, there's division within the body of Christ. In the last number of years, even looking at the legislation that's been passed, the bills that are coming up, it's obvious what is true and right and good. I mean, it's just been thrown to the wind. Where is the church in this? Where is the ecclesia? The, the you know, and that's the New Testament term for church is ecclesia which is the called out ones, those are the change agents, those who carry influence in the public square, who can govern and steward. That's what you and I are called to. Where are those that can help to build the foundations that can reestablish? This is the plumb line, okay? Well, here God has a solution for this of what we should be looking for. They're called the apostles and prophets. And it's found in Ephesians 2, 19 through 21. And the admonition is here. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. Now, Unfortunately, there are, are many in the, I shouldn't say many, there's a segment of the body of Christ that do not believe in apostles and prophets. They believe that the apostles and prophets passed away, you know, when scripture was written, when the last apostle died. Bottom line is, personally, I don't believe in that, number one, because there's no scriptural indication of that. That's really a doctrine of man, I believe. It's, it's not found in scripture. Secondly, in the listing of the gifts that Jesus gave to the church, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, which is also found in Ephesians 4. Why is it that we accept pastor, teacher, evangelist, but not apostle, prophet? You, you can't just separate out and pick and choose which gift you want. They're all there. Thirdly, without the apostles and prophets, we don't have the foundations. Because see, foundations need to be reestablished every generation. To suggest that they did it back in the early church, we don't need them anymore. This is why we are in the situation we are. Our foundations are broken. It's because the apostles and prophets have not been here. And I would suggest not only have they not been here in the church, because we have not led the way, then it has affected and impacted every other mountain of culture, every other part of our society has been impacted with a lack of foundation. And so this is what needs to be righted. 
And, I, and what we are headed into, I believe, is a reestablishing of these godly foundations of what is true and right and good. Even as a nation, this is why our constitution was written. Our founding fathers, they built the nation on some of these foundational truths based on the word of God. It's been broken because we have not, even in the body of Christ, first and foremost, we have not embraced uh, these gifts. And I'm going to be talking more about this in the future because this is going to be my next book that I'm, I'm going to be writing, establishing the fivefold ministry within the local congregation. It's understanding these gifts. This is a passion of mine is to raise up godly leaders. Someone asked me uh, on YouTube, why are you talking about leaders all the time? Well, that's because I am a leader and I see the void. And if we don't have leaders, uh, we're not going to know where we're going. And we're not going to be able to build for our children, for our grandchildren, because there's a legacy that we're supposed to be leaving. We need spiritual moms and dads. You know, my, my easy definition, my simple definition of an apostle, it is not based upon whether or not you have a title. Uh, we get too hung up on titles. The fruit should be an apostolic leader carries the heart of a father and a mother because they're much more concerned about what their sons and daughters are learning, how they're growing, how they're maturing. That's the heart of an apostle. Uh, and then a prophet goes right along with it because the prophet sees that spiritual reality uh, of what heaven is doing and then helps to build you know, for the future and what God has in mind. They're, they're supposed to be working together. This is what needs to be reestablished in the church, is, is embracing and celebrating the grace that's on uh, particular leaders in this regard of apostles and prophets. By, by and large, uh, you know, the United States has been uh, built and established the church in our nation, uh, has been led by pastors and teachers with some evangelists. Certainly there's been some apostolic leaders and, and there's been prophetic leaders, but I don't think it's near to the degree that the Lord wants, obviously, because if we're still shaken right now and, and the Lord wants to firm up, you know, reestablish those roots. It starts at home. It starts with the heart of having a spiritual father and mother. 1 Corinthians 4.15, this was Paul's admonition to the early church. He says, for though you have countless guides and teachers in Christ, you don't have many fathers. I mean, we talk about the fatherless generation. It's true. We need some men and women of God who've had some experience, who have been mature, who care more about others than themselves. They're not so concerned with building their own platform and their own name and fame but they really have a love for others and they wanna serve. It gets back to that servant leadership. Proverbs 1, 8 and 9, because this is a joint ministry of men and women. Hear my son, your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. You know, this is why both men and women are needed in the, these kinds of leadership roles. It's so that we can model what God had in mind uh, all the time. We've gotten too hung up on, on form, method, and style, and we've missed the heart. Do we recognize the heart of a leader that really cares about others, that is there to serve others, and that is concerned that you, know, you, you believe the right things and for the right reasons? This, this is what's being shaken, and so this is what we're gonna have to take ownership in and pray for and become if we're gonna make it out of this. Um, this is, and I want to say a word to women because, uh, you know, a lot of women obviously follow me and I get, you know, emails and messages with this desire, this sense of call that you have, uh, you know, to help others and to help other women. And I just want to say it, it is, it is more than possible. God wants to do a new work. And, you know, we talk a lot about Jezebel and the Jezebel spirit that is rampant and, you know, it's witchcraft, it's rebellion, it's control. And we know all the negative things. Uh, and in my own life and, and testimony, you know, I've uh, shared my own deliverance from that. And it's uh, why I created this teaching resource, Getting Free from Religious Jezebel Leviathan Spirits, because it impacted me so much. Uh, but it's not just enough to get free of these things. If we want to become the role models for the next generation, it's not enough to just get rid of this mindset. We have to really guard our hearts. 
that we don't become that. Uh, and and as, as women, especially as a spiritual mom, that our heart is to serve. It's not about vali- validation. It's not about vindication. We've got to rid our own hearts of any offense, bitterness, unforgiveness, because what God wants to reestablish is this heart of mothers and fathers that are so free themselves, they just pour out for others. That's what the world desperately needs. They're looking for authentic leaders that really care about them. And it's not about what's happening on the platform. So we have a chance to write that. You know, something else that I I teach a lot on and I, I love talking about is faith because we desperately need faith. We're being tested in our faith right now. Uh, because we, we don't see things with our natural eye, and so it requires faith in God. And I've often thought about Abraham as another patriarch that we talk about, the father of faith. He's the father of Israel. But it came to light uh, not long ago, uh, and I found it through Scripture, of why God called Abraham. And it wasn't because he was this tremendous man of faith. It was actually because of his father's heart. And this is very important. And I found this in uh, Genesis 18, 17 to 19. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. The Lord called and chose Abraham because he knew that Abraham would teach his entire household about the ways of God. This is very powerful when we think about an apostolic leader. This is the heart of it, is that we know they want to impart this to others. They want to lay the foundations so that their descendants after them are gonna hold fast to this. Now, as I was reading this and praying about this again, that's when the Lord clarified something about President Trump. I believe that in this first term, what we have seen President Trump, and and this is just my my perspective, because I I operate as a prophetic voice, as, as a prophet, and I have recognized a prophetic anointing on President Trump. Why do I say that? Part of the prophetic call is to, in the book of Jeremiah, you can find that part of the call of the prophet is to pull up and to uproot ungodly practices, mindsets, strongholds. Part of the prophetic call is to see things in the spirit, to discern rightly what is of God and what is not. And for the sake of the people, to call them out and then to do the work to get rid of them so that we can help the apostles then to establish the truth. That's part of being a prophet. Even that watchman call that that prophets have, a watchman sees things. I mean, if you think about a watchman in a watchtower, you know, they're positioned in a way that most people on the ground aren't. And the job of a watchman is to look out beyond and to see what's coming and then to warn the people. I believe that this is what President Trump has been doing ever since he came into office in 2016. He has been pointing out where the enemy is. Now, if we only look at it in the natural, that's where a lot of people have gotten offended by him. Because when he, you know, goes after his enemies, it sounds crass, it sounds harsh. But see, for me, when I've read those comments, I see it spiritually. Because I know the the demonic forces that are behind what he is talking about. And I believe that he has been operating with a prophetic anointing in this first term to warn this nation, to bring this nation to the awareness of this is what's coming. We've got to take notice. We've got to do something about it. But here's the thing. This is why he has to come in for a second term, because I believe in his second term, the fullness of his own father's heart is going to come to a whole new level. And he is going to become an apostolic father to this nation. He is going to reestablish the legal foundations, the constitutional foundations within this nation. Why is that important? It's because it gives us as the ecclesia, the church, the freedom, the atmosphere to be able to fulfill our commission, 
to do what God has called us to do without constraints, without chains, without being forced underground. Certainly God has done that in the past, and God has done that in other nations at other times, where he will take us through a season of you know, the underground church and persecution. But I've said it before, this time in this season is where God is calling the sons and daughters of the king to come forth, to rise up, the spiritual fathers and mothers to come forth to disciple this next generation and for the kingdom to truly come out in the open. This is why I believe President Trump is supposed to be fulfilling this second term is because there is an apostolic function that he is going to fulfill that's going to be a model even for other nations. We are called to disciple other nations. We can do that even outside the church. We, we should be impacting all of these areas of our culture and government is one. And that's why I have full confidence in, in what God wants to do because this, this goes much uh, further than you know just proving who won an election. Uh, it has to do with a commission and how God is reestablishing things here so that we can build for the future and we can nurture and disciple those who are coming after us. And so this is why we should be contending you know, for this and, and standing in faith because I believe that this is God's desire. If the prophets and apostles can again be placed in, in this foundation, and it starts with the church, it starts with the local congregations of embracing this and understanding how does this look practically, but it can also happen at the national level where we can shore up all of these things that have been torn to shreds and we can again uh, build up a, a nation that is under God. That's what God desires. And, and I know that he wants us to be a part of it. And then once the apostles and prophets really do their job, that's, that's then when the other gifts can flourish. And this is where we talk about, you know, the fivefold ministry. And, and the next book I'm going to write about it is how we as the body of Christ can release and commission these kinds of leaders into the world. We're not calling the world to us. No, we as the church, we're supposed to equip. We're supposed to serve. We're supposed to empower this next generation of leaders so that then they can go out and be released and, and do the exploits of God because that's what he's called us to do. Now, this is what I write about in, in my book, uh, you know, Moving from Sword to Scepter, Ruling Through Prayer as the Ecclesy of God. The whole reason I wrote this is because it's a handbook. It's for the body of Christ you know, to, to do what I'm talking about because we don't know how to do it. And we haven't had even, uh, the pastors and teachers have been ill-equipped to even know, you know, what is this supposed to look like? Um, and so this is what can help us. In the last chapter, I talk about this whole idea of leaving a legacy and the need for spiritual fathers and mothers. And I say here, heaven's been preparing the way. There is a rising group of men and women of God who have been hidden but have been prepared for this very mission. This might be you. They are being called by the Spirit of God to prepare a future generation of kingdom ambassadors who are going to shift culture and transform the earth. They are waking up to the reality that their journey has not even been about them, but those following them. Heaven is calling forth these patriarchs and matriarchs with a vision beyond themselves to disciple entire nations. Hebrews Hall of Fame for History Makers is calling forth new candidates with this same vision for heaven's promise. I have a feeling some of you who are listening are those patriarchs and matriarchs. You are the ones that God has been preparing to disciple the next generation. We're called to disciple nations. That's God's plan. He wants to start with this nation. And that's why I believe we can continue to stand because it's, it's in the word of God, it's in his heart. And he's, he's been preparing the way. He's already put it in our hearts. And we have to stand fast in that faith, knowing no, that this is something that he is doing. It goes bigger than the church, it is kingdom. And you know, we need to change our thinking from, from church to kingdom. It's so much bigger than what we thought. It's encompassing every part of our culture where God is demonstrated, God is manifested preparing the way for the harvest to come, for the outpouring to come. I want to encourage you in this. We are supposed to be influencing our culture. 
We are supposed to have such an impact because of what we carry in our hearts, that we carry the authority of heaven, that people begin to ask, why are you so confident? Where is that zeal coming from? And the world really should be looking to us to lead. You know, it says without, without leadership, without a vision, the people will perish. They need vision. They need role models. They need to see that. It says in Proverbs 29.2, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. There's a lot of groaning going on right now. We need to increase. And that word increase means multiply and become great. This is the call of Abraham. And I believe that this is the call on this nation. God has a destiny for this nation and he needs leaders. President Trump is a part of that. You and I are a part of that. And as we contend together, there's gonna to be amazing things that God wants to do. Now, lastly, I do wanna just encourage you, as we prepare the way, we gotta get practical with these things. I mean, the, you know, the revelations are wonderful, but we've gotta put boots on the ground. And where I find most of the disconnect is in the local congregations. What does this look like? And again, that's why I wrote my book, Moving from Sword to Scepter. And I encourage you, if you haven't gotten a copy yet, please consider doing it. There is a video series that I created to go along with this study. I wrote it specifically. It's got 12 chapters. That's prophetic. It was how the Lord had me write it. 12 is the number for government. I wrote it specifically for groups to go through. Entire congregations have gone through it. I, a group of 40 in Florida went through it. A lot of prayer groups go through it. You read a chapter, you watch the 15 minute video clip that kind of gives some highlights and supplemental material. You process it together. And then there's a prayer guide at the end of every chapter. You're asking the Lord, okay, what do we do with this this week? It talks about leadership. It talks about what a local house of prayer can look like, how we're supposed to be impacting our own community. These are the things that God wants to build in the days ahead. And I'm excited to be a part of it. And I hope that you are too because we can't get stuck in, in what we don't see and what we don't know right now. By faith, God is establishing, He is birthing a nation, a new nation under God, and He's inviting you and I to be a part of it. And I hope that you join in. So please go to wandaalger.me and, and subscribe to my blog. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel uh, so that, and get the notifications so that you can stay tuned to what God's doing. In the meantime, let's continue to stand fast, to pray, and to know that good things are ahead as the body of Christ, as the ecclesia, comes forth in Jesus' name.